Thanks, Jen. Uh, so, like it says, uh, I'm Sam Kimbrell. Uh, that's my name on Twitter, GitHub, uh, pretty much everywhere on the internet if you want to reach out to me for this, any questions, anything. Uh, thanks for having me. This is actually my first talk in front of a live audience. So uh, hopefully I won't screw it up too, uh, too badly. Uh, I work at Twilio in San Francisco. I actually came a pretty long way to get out here. Um, I work on their public REST API. And today I'm going to be talking about building web APIs with Flask RESTful. Uh, so let's go over some terminology first. I'm not sure what everybody knows in the audience, uh, what everybody's background is. Uh, so first we'll go over REST uh, and web APIs. So API is application programming interface. Uh, it's become a really popular term in the last decade as everybody's decided that what they want to do is sell access to an API rather to do some service. So that's what Twilio does. Uh, we send text messages for you. We make phone calls. Um, we expose it as a web API. Uh, and REST uh, stands for Representational State Transfer. Um, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot, uh, mostly in arguments over how RESTful something is or is not. Uh, Rory Fielding wrote a paper a long time ago uh, outlining, outlining all the principles that uh, REST systems should obey. They should have a uniform interface for a client-server model. Uh, they should be stateless, cacheable, and so on. Uh, but kind of in my head, I try to think about it as that this idea that the client and server just hand back uh, with the way they want the world to be, uh, handing out a complete and uniform representation in a single exchange uh, that is independent of anything that came before or after. Uh, Flask is a Python micro framework for writing web applications. Uh, it's simple, it's easy to learn, it's pretty expensive, and uh, I think that makes it a great choice for impl implementing web APIs. So if you've seen this before, uh, Actually, there are probably people who haven't seen this before. So uh, here's the canonical Flask hello world. Uh, let's go into what's going on here is we import the Flask object from the module. Uh, we create the application. Uh, application is just where Flask keeps its logic on how to route incoming web requests and to the functions that are going to tell it how to respond to them. And then we try to find a function. Uh, we call it hello. And all it does is return the string hello world. And then we use this route decorator on the Flask app object that says, when you get an incoming request for the root URL, run this function, and it says, hello world. I actually decided it would be a bad idea for my first talk to do a live demo, so I don't actually have this running locally or anything. So we're just going to go with slides. Uh, so cool, that's Flask. Let's write an API with it. Uh, I didn't have any super awesome sudden flash of inspiration for new data models to demo with, so we're going to pretend we're modeling a student registration system for a college or something. If I had done this, if I had written this talk later after uh, Kathy had presented her lightning talk, <laughs> might have had something more fun. But um, here's an example of how we would, in vanilla Flask, implement a web view that returns a JSON formatted list of student objects. We would start by going to the database, getting a list of students, and then looping through them and pulling out the attributes we care about, right? So we might have an ID, have first name, last name, probably a bunch of other stuff in the real world. Um, we're going to pull out a list of dictionaries. And just build that up with all of our, or our student objects. And then we're going to dump that out with JSON and return it with the appropriate response code and a header that says to our client, uh, you should be expecting some JSON right about now. Uh, moving on, uh, we have another example view of how we'd create a student. Um, we'd route this to the same list, uh, except now we're using the post method. And it gives us a little more work to do, right? Because now we're dealing with input. Uh, and we're going to go through our list of fields that we want to let people put, uh, pass to us when they're creating a student, things they might want to specify, so first name, last name, et cetera. And uh, for each one, we're going to build a dictionary of the, object, the args we're going to use to create our student object by pulling it off of the request form. Um, this is old school. It's using just the HTTP form body. Um, if we had a JSON or XML body, this would you know, replace request.form with request.json and work just as well. Um, then we're going to create a student object. Uh, I left out the line of persisting into the database for purposes of fitting this all on the slide. Uh, and then we'll dump out the representation and return to our client. In the real world, uh, this would be a little longer, too, because we'd have some validation. Uh, SQL injection and stored XSS are not fun, so we'd probably want to make sure that our arguments are things that are acceptable to us. And then uh, here's one more example. Um, once we've created some students and we have a list of students, we might want to be able to update an existing student, right? And so now we're going to use a different path of the student slash ID to specify which student we want to update. And we're going to accept a put request, uh, because in REST, put is how you update something that already exists. Uh, 
it should look pretty familiar at this point, um, pretty similar to the create um, extractor input objects, or input arguments, excuse me, um, update the underlying model, uh, transform it, and then serialize the response for our client. Uh, so at this point, we've gone through a couple of these examples of how we would build a REST API, and we can sort of see some patterns starting to emerge, right? Um, the code's pretty straightforward and easy to read, but uh, there's a lot of it that's dealing with things that are not necessarily tied to our application logic. Uh, there are these cross-cutting concerns, and there's kind of one principle of programming that I really want to call out here, which is don't repeat yourself. You've probably heard this as the dry rule if people have left that comment on your code reviews, or of code that doesn't follow this as uh, being wet, which stands for we enjoy typing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, as with every other programming maxim, you can definitely take this way too far, uh, abstract everything, and that's how you wind up with Java frameworks. Um, <laughs> Uh, but there are some pretty clear patterns starting from just from these examples we've gone through already, right? Um, let's go through this code again, and I'm going to highlight some of the stuff that is not necessarily tied to our application logic, right? So here's our Git handler again, and wow, that is dark on this screen. Um, there is actually code on the top and the bottom. It's the same code I showed you earlier, but the stuff highlighted in green, right? Um, all this is doing is taking our logical database objects and formatting them and munging this data around into a dictionary representation that we want to, that is suitable for handing back to our clients. Uh, very similarly, uh, here's our post handler again. Um, now we have two chunks of this, right? And the first one is dealing with input arguments, and the second one is dealing with formatting our output. And our put handler, same thing, input, output. And then if you look at this, you know, there's five lines of stuff in this method that actually handles something that we would have to define as uh, critical to our business logic, right? Um, and half of this screen is just stuff that's taking data in one format and transforming it into another one or the other way around. Um, so in general, I want to call out that um, API implementations, uh, as I found, they spend a lot of time dealing with a few common themes. Uh, input parsing and validation, it's a really big area of Kurtzin for pretty much anybody who's accepting data from other computers. Output formatting and serialization, also a pretty big deal. And finally, um, a well-designed REST API has this nice concept of collections of resources. And uh, if you think back to our examples, we just had this bag of functions at the top level in our application module that all we did to distinguish them from each other was kind of putting the route decorator on them with the same paths, actually. And the only thing keeping them apart was the method. And we had these function names that also duplicated the name of the resource every time, as we have create student, list students. And so I think Flask RESTful is an extension library for Flask that helps you take these concepts and pull them out and gives you patterns to make it easier to implement them in a way that's clean and separate from your application logic. So you can focus on writing just the code that matters to what you're actually trying to implement and reuse code to deal with input, output, and organization. The uh, framework itself actually grew out of work done internally at Twilio uh, as we implemented our current generation of APIs, uh, both internal and external. And it uh, eventually grew into something we felt like sharing with the open source community. It has about 900 stars on GitHub, and we actively maintain it, and we, um, I'll go into something we actually got out of the community recently. Um, we have contribution. It's really great. Um, and let's go through what the framework offers to make life easier when you're writing web APIs in Python. So we'll start with input. We'll go in the same order I did things earlier. Um, so RESTful comes with a module called RecParse, which uh, if you've used Python for a while, you might have seen the argparse module. And very explicitly, RecParse is pattern after argparse. It's actually just a wrapper around argparse under the hood. Uh, and what it does is it takes the responsibility for extracting your input arguments from inbound requests. So we construct a request parser, add some arguments to it, and just like with argparse, uh, we ask it to parse the arguments from the request and give the results. Uh, one of the really nice pieces that uh, recparse implements for you is looking at basically any location on the request that data could come in. It'll look at your query string parameters, it looks at the form body, and uh, as of, I think, two releases ago, it'll actually go and look at the JSON body for you. And um, once you've created that, um, we have this parser object. It parses our objects, our args for us, and gives us a dictionary. Um, it also applies validation, as you said, that type argument. 
statement. Uh, we're saying inputs.date. The inputs module also comes with RESTful. Um, we get, uh, by default, it comes with everything that you can use in Python. So you can also just hand this int um, or string or float. Um, and this will take care of validating that the piece of data you got is the type you expected it to be. And it will throw an error if not. We'll come back to this once we start putting everything together. Um, and Rec Parse is built to work with the rest of Flask RESTful so that if it throws value error, because we didn't get a value, uh, correct birth date, for example, um, the framework will throw back this nice for JSON formatted error message. We won't just throw an HTML formatted 400 um, as you would with vanilla Flask at the moment. Move on to output features. So the framework provides us with a function called Marshall, which can extract data from uh, almost any Python data structure, uh, objects, dictionaries, um, basically anything that has get or get adder. And it'll transform it into any structure we like. So kind of similar to our input, um, we import the fields module, we import the Marshall function, and then we create this mapping from what we want the name of our output fields to be in the serialized response to the type that they should be. Uh, so the fields module comes with ints, strings, floats, uh, URLs, date times, uh, a whole bunch more. And you can also write custom ones, which I'll go into later. And once we've done this, we use the Marshall function to take an object that, you know, maybe a SQL Alchemy database object or some other Python object. Uh, we hand that to the Marshall function with this mapping. And it'll go over all the fields of our mapping and produce a dictionary that contains just the formatted data taken by uh, extracting the attribute from the domain object and applying the right uh, formatter to it. And actually, uh, it has a really neat, more powerful feature, uh, which you can create list structures and nest fields definitions within each other. So if you look at back, here is how we would format a single student. And we can reuse this, right? So we take the student fields mapping and uh, create a list, a list field that says, every entry in this list is actually just a student. So we reuse the format we already have, and we get this list resource structure pretty much for free. So we've gone through how the framework handles input parsing and validation, and we've gone through how we can use the marshalling function to eliminate repeated sections of a code for formatting our objects, right? So now we've done this, uh, kind of gone through our input and output. Let's put everything together and re-implement our resources using the extension. So, uh, here's part of the implementation, uh, just the get handler for now, um, using Flask RESTful. So the boilerplate at the top is we import a few more things, and we wrap our Flask object in the API object. And the API object just endows our Flask app with um, additional routing capabilities based on the resource classes that we're going to add to it, um, and some error handling functionality, which I'll talk about later. Uh, the extension treats each resource as a class. So rather than just having top level functions that say get students, list, uh, create student, delete student, um, we have a student class now that says, okay, we'll have, we'll have a get handler on here, a post handler, a put, and a delete. Um, and as you can see, if we pretend that the code from the f previous slides are fields definitions and uh, input parser were already defined, um, now, our application logic is much more obvious, right? We just get the student. If it doesn't exist, we abort with a 404 and then just marshal our object and hand it back to the client. And once we've defined our resources and all of the methods they expose, uh, we just say add resource to the API with the resource class and the path that it should respond to. So similarly, uh, here's a chunk of how we would implement the list resource. Uh, specifically, this is the post handler for creating a new student. And uh, there's one more little nicety that I've added in here, which is that um, RESTful comes with a decorator called Marshall with, which takes that last line of return Marshall of uh, S with student fields and just automatically applies it to whatever the function returns. So now we can just straight up go and create our student with the args we've got of the arg parser, add it to the database, commit it, and then return the raw domain object, and the decorator takes care of formatting it for us. And then again, we'll add the resource to the API at the end. So you can already see some places where using Flask will speed up our application development and make the code drier and easier to read and maintain. 
Uh, there's a couple other things, though. Kind of the, here's the but wait, there's more section. Um, also, we're also 15 minutes in, and I'm halfway done. So um, it's the last session of the day. I hope everybody appreciates that this should not take a full hour. <laughs> uh, I'd like to go into a couple other ways that we can augment the framework uh, to handle other common needs. So I mentioned earlier that Flask RESTful will take care of content negotiation and serialization for us. Uh, that's true. It's also a bit of a live IO mission. Uh, out of the box, when you install it from pip, uh, you only get a JSON serializer. And we did this on purpose. Um, first off, JSON is pretty much the de facto standard for web APIs at this point. And more importantly, uh, we did this to obey the principle of least surprise. That uh, In this case, you're avoiding the surprise of having a user write in to complain that the XML serializer that you don't, didn't even know you had is broken. Um, and to kind of counteract this, we made it really easy to add new representations. So here's an example of how we do that. Um, the API class already comes with logic to do content negotiation based on uh, content type headers. And uh, all you have to do is define a function that takes the Marshall dictionary structure and the code and headers. Um, you're basically re-implementing Flask's make response um, with some extra logic, right? Uh, and I left out the page or so of code you would need to add actually turn a Python dict into an XML tree. Um, you can find it on Stack Overflow, I promise. It's not too hard, just copy and paste. Uh, so to kind of outline it, right? You uh, create the e-tree element root, and then we do a bunch of extra stuff to actually fill it in, and then do toString on it. Uh, and then we just say make response, which is the class function for making an actual HTTP response object out of some string. And once we've done that, uh, we construct our API as usual, and then uh, we just grab the representations dictionary on the API object and stick in our function under the application XML MIME type. We also have custom data types uh, for both input uh, validation and output formatting. Uh, I'll go through some examples of how you do those. So this is kind of a contrived example. Um, of we only want prime numbers for this field. Um, and all the function has to do is basically behave like Python's built-in uh, type coercion functions, right? And if you think of calling int on something or calling float to force it into that type, uh, do whatever you want to coerce it and validate it. Make sure it obeys whatever X logic you want. In this case, um, we have a prime function, uh, prime testing function. And if it's not prime, then we're going to throw a value error. Um, and otherwise, we'll return the parsed and validated value. And so. This function combines both the input validation step and the parsing value, uh, parsing step, and it should either return that value or just throw an error. Um, and then once we've done that, we can use it just like anything else. Um, take our, rec our parser and add the argument to it uh, using our new, uh, our new function as the value for the type keyword argument. Uh, output is pretty similar. Uh, we'll subclass the base field class, which in this case is called the raw field class. Uh, and then we're going to make a yelling field, which will just uh, uppercase every string it finds. Um, and all you have to do is define a, a method called format that uh, takes the value um, and should return the serial, uh, not the serialized, but the marshaled representation of it. Um, and then very similar to how we did everything else in our example of uh, output fields, uh, we just use our field name in place of uh, uh, fields like enter or fields that string. And uh, finally, uh, and this is actually um, a feature that was recently contributed in the last release from somebody in the community who did not work at Twilio. Um, and we might like to have cleaner error handling than a bunch of if-else or a try-accept blocks scattered all throughout our, our uh, resource handlers. And uh, we now have a mechanism for this. So now the API class, uh, you can hand it an errors mapping uh, when you construct it. And it should look like this. It should map from the string name of the exception class you want to catch, and then map to a uh, marshal dictionary of what you want to hand back to your user in that case. Um, so in this case, uh, we could imagine if we had written some database helpers that will throw a not found error um, if they don't find the row you're, you're looking for by ID. Um, and what happens is that when you construct the API with this error mapping, uh, Flask RESTful at the very top level will catch that error for you and look it up in this mapping and return the corresponding uh, response object. And uh, you can have as many as you want in here. And basically what this lets you do is um, just go through all your code and 
instead of having to say per view, you know, oh, if we didn't find a row return 404, well, just write a database handler so it'll throw not found error. Or um, if um, our arg parse, uh, our rec, rec parse, excuse me, um, our parser didn't like the field and um, we wanted to have a custom error type, we could say a catch value error or catch validation error uh, and return something that has more information for the user. And so this uh, actually concludes everything I've got today. Um, and to recap, uh, we have, we've gone through how you use Flask RESTful's abstractions and library functionality to deal with input validation, output formatting, resource-based routing, serializing your data, custom data types, and error handling. Um, so we actually use Flask RESTful at Twilio to handle the majority of our public API requests, uh, and I really hope you'll find it useful for some of your projects as well. Uh, thanks for coming, and Here's where you can get at the software. Uh, just install it from pip and have fun. Uh, there's a GitHub repo if you want to uh, open issues, pull requests, et cetera. And it's all documented on Read the Docs. And if you have any other questions, I'm on Twitter. All right, uh, any questions? Sure. Uh, so the first question was, uh, how, do you, how do you handle things like rate limiting on the API? Uh, and so uh, the framework actually doesn't expose things like this. Um, it's an interesting uh, question as far as whether we'd want to add something like this. Um, personally, what I kind of enjoy about Flask RESTful is that it tries to stay out of the way of your application logic. Um, and very similar to your second question about authentication, um, uh, there is actually a function um, or a functionality in the framework for saying um, my method decorators. Um, so if you want to have, you can imagine uh, if you've done Flask work um, and you want to add authentication, you want to add rate limiting, et cetera, you might wind up with a function that has six decorators stacked on top of it, right? Um, and so the, AP, the resource class, um, you can construct it um, with a list of method decorators to apply. Um, and it will do that automatically for you when it constructs the view callable um, at request time and apply all of them in the already specified. And um, it's fully compatible with anything you might get from uh, Flask auth or uh, any of the other extensions out there. Uh, as in terms of how you would do rate limiting, um, it's kind of app specific, but um, without going into too much detail, uh, how we do it at Twilio is we actually care more about concurrent requests um, because that's what consumes resources. And so basically, um, using the username or the account ID or whatever of whoever is making the request, um, increment a counter and then decrement it when they're done and just wrap that around all of your requests. And if, if and then check at the start, right? If they've gone past their limit, then throw 429. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right, oh, thank you.